Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe in which we're playing as that beautiful Magadan under, at least for now, Matkovsky, but the Siberian Bill of Rights. This is too far liberal, Petlin, Matkovsky said, holding back his anger. It seems almost socialist to me. He put the set of files down and pressed his index finger against it. This is not acceptable. It was inconceivable that you would present this to me in the first place. How could he do this? Petlin, the man he considered to be almost a brother to himself, his own foreign minister, he stared into Petlin's eyes, finding fear and obedience settling their weight into his psyche. Maybe this was not intentional after all. Sir, if I might explain myself, Petlin said, freezing his hand before he could correct his tie. The Americans are different from us. We need to... I get your point, Petlin. It's just, Minkowski said, waving off Petlin. This is not what I, not we, stand for. When I read your document, I round found phrases like the right to assembly, right to free speech. These are all dangerous ideas not fit for Russia. The rebellious intent practically jumps off the pages. Mikoski sighed. Just what the heck were you thinking, brother? Petlin gathered himself and stood straighter. Sir, if I may insist, my ideas can still be useful, not only in convincing the Americans, but the Russians as well. He cracked his knuckles in anxiety. I have faith in the in the strength of our ideals and convictions, sir. I do. I beg you not to mistake my incompetence as rebelliousness. Metkovsky felt a rare moment of generosity. Stretching his arms wide, Petlin, Petlin, he said, tapping his foreign minister on the shoulder. I would never. You have been with us since the beginning, closer to me than even my chancellor. He whispered to Petlin. Now, help me with all these. I'm afraid that your brother lacks the skill necessary to convince the Americans. Yes, yeah, yeah. Petlin said, his voice trembling. I will do as you say. Good. Now, cut back. We can't afford all this. Make holes and loop them. Dismissed. Petlin left the room in a great hurry. Sacrifices have to be made. Beautiful. And yeah, we're still going to rush down this American path, or this American side, and then get to... Doesn't really matter which one we do, but we're going to do promise to reform. Now that we've stated our intent to ensure freedom for our own citizens, it is time to appeal to the U.S. directly. Instead of beating around the bush, in an address made by Arvaz in front of the citizens of Magadan and directed at the White House, he will state that the regime, even though it was born out of the RFP, is open to reform and it will not fight it, but embrace it instead. The hope is that this great call for reform will reach the ears of the congressman and even the president himself, and it will finally change their minds regarding the issue of Russia and how to best approach it. Very good, very, very, very good. We need as much political power here because right now we're building new schools because we had enough loot. And we're trying to raise relations with the Americans, and I've already purchased guns, and we still can't get infrastructure. But, you know, whatever. Anything else here different? Research is not bad. Not really worth it, though. Cool. So we want to increase our relations with the Americans as much as possible. American support is very low, so be it whatever. And our secure position, we need all the following. The Vaz. Oh, yeah, I'll do that one. Anastasi Andreevich. Ovonsiatsky, or as he prefers to be known as the Vaz of the Russias, is a leader of the fascist emigres in America. Once a close partner of the Russian fascist party, Radzevsky's pro-German rhetoric drove him away, leading his own political organization of the white Russian emigres, the RFO. He has garnered significant support from the Russian refugees currently residing in the United States. Now that we've split from Radzevsky, perhaps Ovonsiatsky would reconsider his support for the Russian fascist party, having the back wing backing of the foreign base RFO would give us a source of income untouched by the bandit raids of Radzevsky or others. Along with this new stream of income, there are rumors that he knows one of the most dangerous men in America, a former OSS operative named Mitchell Werbel III. If there's a chance that the VOD can put us in touch with him, we must reach out immediately. Also, so there's quite a few comments, especially in support of this campaign, saying it's time to get rich, it's time for guns and freedom, and such like that. So yeah, absolutely. Now, once you get Webel, of Ebel, Werbel the Third, um, there, there, he can take like a few different paths, or at least two different paths, depending on how you play as him. So, from my understanding, he can be like completely a complete merc, just absolute one hundred percent mercenary, or he could become a Cincinnatus or something like that. So. We'll see what happens, because I have played up until that point, and there's a little triangle here that tells you which path he's going to go down or something like that, so. I haven't played this fully yet, but we'll see what happens. I'm here for a good time, which like you guys are. And time for some coffee as well. Hopefully we can raid again against the Saka Republic, because we beat them first, and then they beat us, and then we beat them back up. In the last episode. Cool. America's at war, and welcoming Warbled. The son of the Tsarist officer in the, white, in the White Armies, 
Mitchell Larable the third became an OSS operative during the Great Patriotic War. Among the theaters he served in were the then British Burma and former French Indochina. After the war ended decisively in Japan's favor, he returned to America to work as a mundane job before deciding that combat was his calling. Since then, he has served in many conflicts the world over, earning him the fearsome nickname the Wizard of Whispering Death. The Gosky has said that it would be in the party's interest to welcome the character of a man into our ranks. Along with him will come his entourage, a collection of mercenaries who have fought across the world and are now looking to fulfill any need for wet work. We will welcome him and his crew to the port of Magadan. From there, well, they will have their work cut out for them. They shall find that there is wet work to do to their heart's content. Awesome. <clears throat> the Count of Fascism. Zadarova, brother Makovsky, a man hailed from the piers of the harbor. A lean body and a pale face, with a hand stretching out into the early morning air, waving to Makovsky. Mr. Vonsiatsky, also known as the Count of Russian Fascism, had set foot on the port of Magadan. He strode forward, his steps eager and his gait quick, impatient to meet his, his so-called equal in the old world. Covering his nose once he discovered the smell of the docks, he looked small, pathetic against the backdrop of wooden fishing ships about to depart into the morning light. Makovsky furrowed his eyebrows. No one in this world currently has the right to address him in such a way. Giving an awkward, pained smile towards Von Siatsky, he and his bodyguards walked towards to meet the Count. Extending his hand, a gesture of hospitality, Metkowski said, uh, Oh, Zrastutsyet, how has America treated you? Von Siatsky wasted no breath in clasping Metkowski's open palms. Great brother, he leaned forward, planning to catch Metkowski in a hug. <clears throat> but unfortunately, Metkowski relented. America must have changed Von Siatsky. The intimate gestures, the over-enthusiastic, unreserved spirit, and that greeting is all a bit much coming from a fellow Russian, still drunk in that spirit. Von Siatsky said aloud, It is a land of the free, and all this, he gestured with his hand, is too small for us. You seem to forget the reason you are here, brother, Metkovsky said, a hint of coldness in his voice. No, no, he dipped his hands in his pocket. This this man is a gift from me to you. He showed Metkovsky a black and white photograph of an American in a beret. Tell me more. And America is, of course, like I said earlier, at war. Look at that political power, nice. <clears throat> Not much we can do. Ooh, we got level 6. Train our troops. Ooh, we need a little more manpower. We do have 7 army XP. I'm kind of just waiting to see if we can do anything else besides that one first. We've got another week before available. We have Brusilov, like we said yesterday. We also have... Voronotsov and Nakimov. Or something like that. When do we get the next research? Oh, it's going to be a while. So, let's go do this one. Old Money, the Russian fascist organization in Vonsiatsky's fascist political group, is home to some of the wealthiest donors within the Russian emigre community. Now that we have his backing, it's time to turn the funds they have provided to a higher cause and parties and gatherings in a land that will never be their home. The sons and daughters of Russia and America shall no longer find their money squandered by party functionaries for frivolous things. Now they support a real movement. The RFO shall channel their money from America and across the Bering Strait in the form of hard currency or even equipment, whether it be war or industry related. These funds and supplies will help us immensely in the coming conflict against the Splitters and the Reds. Soon we shall prepare for these estranged siblings of our own, or our ours, to return to a Russia they've known since their childhood. It's a strong, capable Russia, one without an equal in the world. More political power and base stability. The Wizard of Whispering Death. A light curtain of drizzle had descended upon the port of Magadan. The clouds adorned their bodies with a steely gray, and the waters of the harbor tugged and pushed their way inland. Their course halted by the low-lying sea walls. Amid the piers, rows upon rows of wooden fishing ships lay steady, their hulls quivering in the fierce wind, shallow rain, and restive waves. There was one vessel that stood out among the others, a metal deck, with rust coating its bows. The tumultuous air did not even seem to flinch it. Metkovsky followed, followed by an aide bearing an umbrella to shield him from the downpour, walked towards this strange vessel. If Von Siatsky had been speaking the truth, then there was no question to the owner of the ship, Mitchell Webel, or Mabel, Webel, legendary mercenary, the veteran of a thousand wars worldwide, infamous soldier of fortune, the wizard of whispering death. Metkovsky steeled himself to meet this legend of a man before seeing a figure stumbling out of the ship, staggering before him. Metkovsky blinked. There was no mistaking yet. The figure was Webel, looking more green than in the photographs Metkovsky had seen of him, a beret hanging precariously to his scalp. Metkovsky tightened his pace, striding forward at such a pace that his aide had difficulty in following him. When he came to face to face with Webel, the man tried to give a clumsy smile, only for it to be mistaken for contempt. Welcome, Metkovsky said in English. We've been expecting you, Mr. Webel. Privyat, Mr. Webel said. My tovarish. He continued in Russian, mixing it with English words when he had no clue which words to use. Mitkovsky, for his part, tried to dissuade him from bastardizing the Russian language, and occasionally a word or two made it through Orwell's manners, but he was inconsolable. With what little correct Russian he spoke was sprinkled with generous helpings of F and bad word. 
Blushing furiously in anger and embarrassment, Mikowski finally extended his hand. <laughs> Here's, Mikowski said, trying to keep a smile in place, to a, to a start of a beautiful friendship. Webo clasped his hands with neither doubt nor comprehension. Da, Tovarish. <laughs> uh, that's funny. And here we are. There he is. 15% popularity. Nice. Alright, is there anything we can do? Improve American relations? You bet we are. And down here, anything else? Oh, we could do that, but we'll see. Oh, we actually have... Nice. 17 army XP. Now, we're training some of these guys as well, but I did it just because we need more soldiers on the line, and these guys actually cost more anti-tank, and I don't know if we can actually make anti-tank currently. So, we'll see what happens. Oh, prepare raid. Oh, yes, please. Now we're ready to do it anywhere here, so... I'm going to put you up there just in case. And... Please let us go to war. Please let us go to war. Old money, let's go do integrate the mercs. The mercenaries at Webo brought in leagues ahead of our current soldiers. How could they not be? After fighting wars of the world over, they are perhaps the most elite force from the Far East, surpassing even the Red Army remnants that the Reds have. They've proven themselves to be a capable asset to Matkovsky so far, and although their loyalty is only as strong as their pay, they may be well worth the money. However, due to their independent nature, these mercenaries have also been functioning outside the command structure and only taking orders from the commanders and are generally uncooperative except for the direct orders from Mikowski himself. This practice must end. We will integrate the mercenaries into the rank and file. Having better skills does not mean that one is exempt from a subordination to a superior. Cooperation with a mercenary like Werbel might be distasteful for some Russians, but the day that Russia can stand on its own is still in the distance. More army XP? He's going to bring along some friends. We love having friends. Good? Good. Come on, give in. You're not that strong. They tr pay the tribute. Beautiful. Now, we might get attacked in... At least for a while until we get the next loot. Scalvin scavenged? Scavenged. Yes. And which we'll do new just so quickly, because that's still good to do. Still good. Look at that. <clears throat> we got agriculture going up quite a bit, as well as industrial equipment. For a month. For a month, not bad. Integrate the mercs, and then we should do... Oh, Operation Interlude. Uh, that seems okay. Naval bases are okay. Not really that worth it. The Tsar. Just barely separated from her territory by the Bob forces of Rodzewski, Cheetah has more in common with us than the most other warlords. An evolution of the uh, diverse emigrant movements and organizations that appear in Harbin, the regime had based itself not on fascism, but Tsarism. The group of white generals behind Cheetah's foundation approached Michael Andreevich, a descendant of the Romanovs, yet one with little legitimacy as a contender for the throne, and took a part of Yagoda's empire as it collapsed. We share a lot in common with both in our ideologies and our enemies, and Mikhail seems eager to cooperate and forge a closer relationship for now. It might be difficult due to the lack of an overlord or overland connection, but that not stop us from making contact with our new friends at Cheetah, an ultimatum. So we receive an ultimatum from Yakutia, they're demanding that we hand over a tribute to Lulu, or the Elsa Raiders, and take it away from us. We are an impasse to decide. Do we decide to engage in confrontation with Yakutia, or possibly risking our men dying at the hands of our enemies, or do we instead stand down and cave in through their demands, giving them the desired loot, allowing our men to live to fight another day? Go suck yourself, Yakutia or Saka Republic. Please cover us. Oh, yeah, it's gone. Now, oh yeah, we're definitely going to win this one. The White Mouse, Webble checked his watch. 20 seconds to 10 p.m. Siberian time. He also had his radio laid out in front of him and ready to transmit. Before the communication could proceed, however, he ordered all of his men out of the room, preferring to be alone. While the matter was not confidential, he wanted to keep everything private. Tonight was a special night of time to talk with an old friend. So long as she also held her... Held to her schedule, that is. Ten seconds out, Werbel rubbed his hands against his temples. The Siberian business was hard, and Matkoska was proving himself to be no pushover. Werbel smirked. The gosh darn dude would have his due. Fingers on the dial, two seconds out. When he reached ten o'clock, his right hand snapped, finding this frequency that she used, locking onto it without difficulty. He reached for the microphone and spoke at it. White Mouse, he said, ex waiting expectantly for a reply. Are you there? You're late, a kindly maternal voice replied. Maybe age has slowed you down a bit after all. She laughed. Werbel smiled. On the other side was a white, my, white mouse. One of the Brits who had the backbone to fight in a war and be good at it, and a comrade during all those times where the Americans lost the torch of liberty before falling down a set of stairs to, degrace, to disgrace. Good to see you, wizard. He saw her firm, proud smile beyond the radio waves. Likewise, mouse, Werbel said, kicking back in his seat. The microphone standing precariously on his chest. How is Kamchatka? Is it a crap hole, too? He felt her frowning at him. Language wizard, she said, sighing, but yes, there's not too much to do around here. Still looking up to Uncle Sam? You know it, she said. I know you've gone to, you've gone Indian and all, but the OS... No, the CIA has a proposition for you. Forget it, he said, fuming. Make no mistakes. You like Nixon. Only a good American could bring America back together, not these cowardly liberals with their talk of peace, land, and bread. Communists. He just couldn't let go. I still remember the last time I worked for those no-good bass... The white mouse hushed him. We also have taken your concerns to mind. She spelled her plans out for him, his eyes widened. 
Heck of a plan, Warbo said laughing. You mad dudes. The shadow grows. Or shadows grow. Alright, so we're doing that. You know what? At this point, let's go and grab some of this then. We got enough political power for it. Ah, uh, they're looking real good. And before the battle ends... Wow. 10% strength. You get 9, 8 maybe? Oh, enemies defeated. If you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. Has Buggity finally done it? May God help us all. Oh, look at this. Look how happy this guy is. Jerry Mogok. Looks so happy. There you go. Uh, you guys go stay right there. That's fine. And the Tsar, smuggling routes. The biggest problem with reaching a mutually beneficial relationship with the Tsar Mikhail stat State has been finding an answer to the question of how we should reach them. But we've developed a solution. It's a well-known fact that here in East in the Far East, the settlements and links between them are few and far between. This means that if we're careful and closely examine our pathways and schedules, it is actually possible to create a route or even several of them that will be able to connect us to Cheetah through secret means. These routes, guarded by our best men, will allow for a flow of weapons and resources that go both, both ways, even in the transport of emissaries between our states. If we can smuggle anything to and from Cheatham, that is a good first step in overcoming geography and establishing diplomatic relations. And infrastructure. The Pretender. <clears throat> to the honorable claimant to the throne of Russia, the letter read so far. We have come to beseech you for your aid against our mutual enemy, the traitor Konstantin Rodzevsky. No, the letter ought not to be so direct. Putting down his pen, Metkovsky laid his hand across his face and sighed. Leaning his forearm against the table and propping his head against his open palm, he stared at the page, waiting to be filled with his writing. His tea sat right below him, his smell tempting him. Metkovsky tapped his feet. He has no time for that now. For the first time in a long while, Metkovsky found himself adjusting his glasses, his fingers wrapping the tape on a sequence. A thousand questions swarmed his mind. What if the Tsars reject the treaty? What if they find the terms unacceptable? He shuddered to think of what would happen if both sides did not cooperate against Rodzewski. Someone knocked on the door. Rather than answering, Metkovsky's index finger mimicked the rhythm of his table. Standing from his seat, he said aloud, The letter's not yet ready. Go away. The knocking stopped. He looked at the letter, clapping his hands together, and drawing a deep breath, he sat down, toying with his pen as he thought of what to say to Mikhail. We, pre we appeal in the name of our old friendship, he scribbled without much thought, in the empty Bolshevik front, as we know. As we all know. He found his hands picking up speed. Before long, he would stand in and say, The letter is ready. Come on in. <clears throat> A hunter's view. Nikita strode into the lawn of, or town of Magadan, confidence invested in every step of his gait. His rifle, which he had slung behind his back, provided a comfortable weight, an anchor that kept his livelihood going. In his arms, he carried the hide of a moose, a worthy prey well, whose coat will suit a gentleman of Hobbin snugly. Today, perhaps Nikita could earn a bit more than he needed to survive for another week. Maybe a pack of cigarettes, or even a can of powdered coffee. In his head, he toyed with the image of the vase wearing something made from the lovely hide of this, of this moose. As usual, the RFP officials and thugs guarded every entrance to the city, their brown uniforms contrasting with the pale buildings of the town, however... Nikita noticed that the RFP now had new companions among the ranks, sharply dressed men and women armed to the teeth and speaking a thousand foreign languages concealing or congealing into a tower of Babel manifested in the outskirts of Russia. It was quite the sight with the mercenaries keeping to themselves and the Russians eternally suspicious of what was going on. The officials cleared him to, to enter the town provided that he left his rifle in their checkpoint. They sold the hide for some good cash. Money could use to buy bullets, provisions, food, and some medical supplies to last him for another week. There was something new to the town, however. American products, American coffee, cigarettes, and even radios were available and quite even, common even. They were cheaper than native Magadan goods, although they were often sold out by the end of the day. Nikita bought a pack of cigarettes and a can of powdered coffee, smiling at his newest gains. He strolled to the edge of town, returning to his home in the northern reaches of Siberia. Another good day's catch. All right, anything else here? Six? Oh, yes. Industrial investments, absolutely. Oh, don't want to pause it and then do that. Cool. What else happened? Five? It's still not bad. Not bad. Are we building anything? Yes, civilian factories. Uh, Turkestan stand clear one. Karakal, Pakistan. Okay, cool. Good luck with that, guys. Good luck. What do we got here? We have eight. Oh, oh, we got the thing done. Nice. Equipment. Absolutely equipment. And then, putting aside our differences. We and the royalists of Cheetah have much in common, and yet we have many disagreements as well. We share a common background, but while they trace their roots into the old ways of the Tsar's empire, our ideology stems from a new and fresh movement. That of Russian fascism. Of course, it is a faith in the old Russian generals and politicians in the power of a monarch that separates us. But that does make reconciliation impossible in this dire environment. To face a common enemy that is Rodzewski's fascist party, we will make a move showing our friendship and respect for Cheetah, by proposing a pact of cooperation and non-aggression with them. If they, act, if they accept, then we may even have a chance to strike at Amur with more safety, which would not be a bad thing. I thought we were supposed to get an event from the last one, too, but whatever. Relations? Yes, please. Uh, and see, Q-Control? Yeah, even more stability is nice. 
Because we're going to lose stability later on as we core more stuff, so. Ooh, wait, we can buy American trucks? Yeah. Awesome. So we got... Oh, wait, look at all that artillery we have. We need more manpower. But... We got a little bit of anti-tank. We've got a, a few things of guns. Not bad, not bad. But it's our differences. <clears throat> Divide and conquer. Since the day we split from the RFP hardliners, Rodzewski's forces and Amur have been the biggest threat to our survival. No other frontiers have heavily guarded as their southern one. It's not uncommon for the situation there to escalate into raids and skirmishes by the border garrisons. Now that we've found allies in Cheetah, we can make a show of force to demonstrate our power and test our capabilities as well. We'll find the perfect moment to strike. And when we do raid a larger... When we do raid, we do a raid larger than any other we've launched, we'll begin. The Tsars will help distract Rodzewski's army in the east, and will hopefully improve our position in the freezing lands of eastern Siberia. <coughs> the Treaty of Cooperation here is a treaty that the Tsars sent. Petlin said, placing the draft of the agreement on the table, sir. He almost adjusted, adjusted his tie again before the stern stare of the vase stopped at his left hand. Yet those eyes did not judge Petlin's mannerisms in any detail. They went up and down the document, examining its fine print, looking for chinks in the deal that the Tsars or even the RFP for the matter could exploit. No word on it seemed to raise any reaction from Mitkovsky beyond an occasional rise of eyebrows and a nod. Putting the document aside, Mitkovsky turned to address his foreign minister. Petlin, he said, chilling every bone in the minister's body, he gulped. It was a moment of truth where the vase would deliver his final verdict. Good work! Medgoski said after a few moments, You exceeded my personal expectations before I can sign this. He picked up a pen, toying with it. Is there anything you'd like to add? Petlin drew a deep breath. No, he said. There's none. Medgoski's hand promptly drew a signature on the document. It is done. He dropped the pen and rose, delivered this to the representative of the Tsars, and tell him that the Vaz accepts the deal and death to Radzewski. Saying in front of Petlin, he offered his hand. I appreciate that I have at least one competent person in charge of the affairs around here. A smile, rare thing for Medgoski to show. Petlin shook his hand. Yes, sir. I will do as you say. Your compliments are a high praise for my blood and station, sir. Medgoski patted his shoulder. All it is work. Petlin turned and left where he became him. Death to Rodzewski. Very good. We have a non aggression pact with, was it Cheetah? And Amur, hopefully, will be ours. The all Russian government of Amur. What a fancy, nice flag. <laughs> Basing rights, huh? Cool. Divide and conquer. Operation Intrude. The port of Magadan is one of the biggest Russian naval facilities still not occupied by foreign enemies. When the w well, weather permits it, ships, Russian or not, regularly make stops for numerous reasons. However, the port also has one more use to become a receiver of American equipment and supplies. Thus, our leader Mikoski has advised a plan to make an offer the Americans will not refuse. Magadan is quite close to the Japanese home islands, that just across O. Okhotsky. And radar station here would have give our future allies the opportunity to spy on their sworn enemies from a closer distance. Perhaps this will make them understand the benefits we can offer and they will decide to help us. Very good. Get a dockyard, two naval bases, and a radar station. Don't mind if we do. Happy 1963, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. And we're doing so well against the Saka Republic. It'd be a shame if we didn't continue it. An absolute shame. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, look at that. He's a mercenary. Special Forces Attack and Defense. That's actually really cool. Pavlov is really not bad at all. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to keep him, but... You know, since we have him, he's got more attack. Look at that. With that beret. Oh, so good. And he's going to be on the offensive. Yeah. And this is sort of why I want to make sure that... Werble gets... Um, oh, we actually made a division. Oh, two divisions. Nice. <clears throat> Helicopters, because they're special forces. Our position secured. Our secure position. <clears throat> the Tsars and Cheetah have agreed to a temporary truce, and they are even willing to cooperate in limited capacity. The Americans have been appealed or appeased by our promises to reform, together with a bill of rights promulgated and Magadan and sent to American agencies from overseas. The support of emigrants has become ours, as von Siatsky has deigned to join us in the crusade to liberate our sacred homeland. Our position is firm. Secure. It is now time to solidify these advantages as Metkowski's ideas take root in the Far East. Before the party, Magadan proceeds to its holy task. Perhaps it's time to stop and let the results of these treaties simmer for a while. Let the funds overseas flow into the coffers of the party with American support ensuring steady gains. The limited cooperation with the Tsars and Cheetah will continue as we raid Zalzewski's followers from both sides. Soon, Metkowski will use all that he has gained for his next step, a Siberian army. Nice. Very nice. So we've got this, and I did say I want to get helicopters, so I'm going to immediately start researching this stuff. It's going to take too long to research, but that's alright, whatever. Death of hope. <clears throat> Basile lived in Magadan for his entire life, and the time since the fall of the old Union, the town had seen many highs and many more lows. The lack of trade practically erased the local economy, and the pirates and smugglers out of Kamchatka were the only freight leaving the city, the city these days. Basile had been the head of the dock workers' union before the RFP took over, and he was only narrowly spared the noose by denigrating himself and denouncing the union in front of his former friends. Now, 
He sat outside a local bar, puking his guts out after a lo another long day of drinking. When it seemed that he could stand on his own, he tried to rise, but only managed to, put to puke on a stranger's boots. He coughed out an apology and readied himself for the beating that never came. The stranger helped him up and steadied him before he could tip over. Here, drink. He Here, drink. He heard before the canteen of water was thrust into his hands. Thanks about them boots. I'd offer to get him replaced, but well, I spent my last ruble on the boots I just spat out. The stranger flinched back as his breath hit him. The man just took his canteen before him, escorting Basili back home. Everyone could call his shack on the outskirts of the city home. Sitting on the rusted bed, he saw the stranger sit on an old bar stool he had lying around. The man peered at him a moment before showing him an old, worn photo. Do you recognize them? Vasily looked closely and realized he could. Yeah, that's old Aaron and his family. Look, kid, if you're looking for them, ain't no point. They were purged before the RFP split. All of them are dead now, I'm sorry. Uh, see, thank you. The stranger stood suddenly and turned to leave, though not before dropping a sack of rubles on the stool. A hope dashed. God bless Uncle Sam. Mason felt nervous. Even though he was an American agent trained in both formal and spoke Russian, he never had conversed in any depth with the soldiers, much less given instruction and introduction to American weapons. He smirked. There was an irony to it all. Despite having been schooled and educated in one of the most renowned countries on earth, Mason was out of his, out of his depth as the, the illiterate Russian fascist standing before him. The cold, chilly air of the early morning gave his percussive head heartbeat a tinge of anxiety and excitement in his veins. The training fields were empty save for a few animals scurrying underfoot. An officer prefaced him. From the honorable nation of America he goes, Mason has come, a bunch of feel-good bromides and legalese, but he guessed that the soldiers needed to respect him first before they would be willing to listen to him. If you caught him eyeing the equipment he brought here. Mason didn't think it was all that impressive considering the things he had seen while working in the agency, but oh, well, whatever. Cultural and technological differences. A few hour, a few hour long anxiety ridden minutes, it was finally his turn to speak. He drew back his tongue and lashed it out, throwing the dust off the language he seldom used. Hello, he said, as the officer has said, my name is Mason. He grabbed an M1 Grand and held it against his shoulders. This is the Grand. You, he pointed to a random soldier in the crowd. Fire your weapon, see how fast you can. He pointed to his target in the distance. The soldier had to eject his casings every time he fired. <laughs> Sometimes he resorted to hitting his rifle with his wrist before it worked. Now watch this. He aimed the Grand and fired eight rounds in succession. His streak stopped by the ping of the gun. He laid the rifle beside him, its butt on the ground, and that is American firepower, he said and to the odd fascist. Any questions? Oh, look at that. Support N. Anti-tank equipment. Stuff that we could actually really, really use, even though now we need more guns. Oh, boy. Scan for loot. Initiate raid. There we go. Give up, boy. Give up. Should be paid. Thank you very much. Actually, is that enough? I know we only have one stuff. So, Siberian Army. The agreements that we've secured with the foreign powers, mercenaries, and the Tsars have brought us valuable time and given us room to breathe. Now the party can turn its eye towards the chief of its means of its holy task, the army. While the party is no pacifistic organization, the militant wing is so far consists of trainees and militia drawn up in the streets and outskirts of Magadan. Given guns are either crude or non-functional, if, if the push west is, is going to happen, we need to reform them into a proper professional army. We have several options for how we can approach this. First is to adhere to a doctrine suited for our local force. After all, Russians know how to best fight Russians on soil. On Russian soil. The second is to request American advisors whose experience in the proxy wars of the world of the world could win Russia as well. The last is the option of adopting wearable techniques in assembling our forces. His expertise will not disappoint us. Whichever we choose, the grand test continues. Very nice. Magadan Free Radio broadcast forty five. The Siberian hunters sat around a table. On it was a radio and an American brand powered by batteries instead of regular electricity. They had bought this from, or bought this from an admittedly sketchy merchant selling American goods in the port of Magadan. Still, the surface of the thing was shining with a polish, a particularly American brand of burnishing that made cheap things look luxurious. They turned the dial to Magadan Free Radio, whose frequency they had scribbled onto a piece of paper earlier. The mix was better this time. As usual, they played Russian patriotic songs with the Siberian hunters singing and humming along to the melody despite having no idea what they to what the lyrics were. Instead of cutting entirely, the radio quieted as the talk show began. Welcome to Magadan Free Radio, a coarse voice with some lip smacking, but not as much as before. Your only source of news in the Far East. I'm here with my co-host, Vasily. Hello. A smooth baritone with some genuine cheer in how we talk now. Tonight is another cold Siberian night, but rest assured, the MRF will go nowhere. What is our subject tonight, Sergei? I hold in my hand a genuinely a genius American invention, Mr. Facility. A deodorant! Truly magnificent! Still get uncapped the deodorant, making sure to be as audible as possible. Pop! Smell that, Mr. Facility. Hmm, and what does it do, Sergey? It's just the thing! It blocks body odor! Sergey stopped as if applying it over his skin. This deodorant, imported from America, should fit all of you Siberian savages out there in the woods. The room was silent, Mr. Facility. Why are you staring at me like that? Looks like they still need to work on their presentation. Oh, wow, that's a lot of stability! Awesome. Now we're, I guess we're capped at actually 84%, huh? It seems like, yeah, we're actually capped at that. That's not cool. But whatever. Hey, we've got 12 guys in the army because it's a new month. 
Oh, maybe we're gonna keep them. Nope, never mind. They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. They left. Bye bye. Siberian army. Because we gotta start doing our land after too. Wash elections. You're looking kind of thick there, but not too thick. We've got to go with the mercenary force. While others advocate for a national army with differing approaches to war, for the infamous mercenary war bolt presents perhaps the most audacious, audacious plan to reform Magadan's armed forces. He proposes an army beholden not to any national identity, but only to money and pay from the highest bidder. He desires an army of soldiers without borders, coming from all around the world to fight for the most prominent cause of freedom with this side of Siberia, Mikowski. Although flattered, Mikowski has reserved reservations about his idea. <clears throat> If we choose to go down this path, we invite every mercenary we can with liquid money from our benefactors in America. The party will permit its current formations to exist in the current form and fill or extend them with mercenaries as it become available. Perhaps the most radical path of an army reform, the decision to continue on this path is not to be taken lightly. While it is necessary for our undertaking, many in the party itself doubt Warble's good intentions. <clears throat> wow, 7,500 more manpower? That's a lot more. Very, very good. Making progress. In the morning, since Madkowski's scathing inspection of the Magadan Karras, and there seem things seem to go from bad to well surprisingly good. Madkowski's generals and administration have taken it upon themselves to figure out some way to improve the RFP's fighting ability. The answer was simple. Muse one senior officer. When we realized we couldn't use conscripts, we bought soldiers from abroad instead. Indeed, mercenaries and military advisors, state sponsored or otherwise, have been slowly but surely streaming into the frozen port of Magadan to not only pad Mikoski's army of ill suited conscripts, but to train them as well to crack the whip and bring them kicking and screaming into the world of professionalism. The fat ones were now skinny, the malnourished ones healthy. All of them had a semblance of the fighting spirit for the first time ever, and the guns, while anarchic or archaic, were at least clean to maintain properly. Training as bare bones as it was, actually began to prepare the conscripts and the mercenary counterparts for the reality of modern warfare in the frigid forests and marshes of Siberia. All this, of course, was tacked on to a very long and expensive bill that Mikowski had to pass off to his administration. He was confident that there would be something for them to pay the mercenaries with. After Mikowski's second inspection of the troops, which, like the first, was kept as a surprise, he once again called a meeting with his general staff. <clears throat> As they filed in, worried that the new inspection was not enough of an improvement from the original, many nervously fiddled with pens and reports while others looked anywhere but where Mikowski stood. As they all assembled, the vase broke. As after this second inspection, he said in his normal reserved manner, I want to say good job to all of you. Many were surprised. I know that the task I assigned to you was not an easy one, and while we're far from perfect, I'm pleased with the progress that we're making. The path to seek out mercenaries and foreign support was one that I would... It was not one that I would have expected, but it's clearly working, and I will be meeting with some top advisors about increasing numbers and effectiveness of these foreigners. And then finally, the rare thank you dismissed. Now we're getting somewhere. Awesome. That's a cool picture down here. Very cool. Awesome. We still have no manpower. And we actually have nine factories. It's not too bad. Hey, we actually have some, uh, we're making some trucks. Not bad. Not bad. Cool. Mercenary force. Follow with soldiers without borders. Uh, ultimatum. We'll not back down so easily. Cool. Actually, let's, let's look at that one first. And they're, okay, they're attacking the exact same place. That's so dumb for them. But whatever. But Goski made his decision. The Verbal is now free to pursue his program for army reform. All standing units of the party are not currently under his control shall continue to exist. But will be joined with the mercenaries that will be arriving soon from around the world. Mikowski believes that the Werbel will live up to the trust that he has been placed down, or placed in him. And the army of soldiers without borders will become the deadliest force in the Far East in short order. In the meantime, the Werbel will be pulling out all the staffs to ensure that the Far East is a prime place for a mercenary to find himself in. From all the corners of the globe, troops will continue to arrive, pledging to find the name Mikowski, the champion of freedom and democracy in Russia. All who hear the call shall heed its message, and the warlords and the world's mercenary underground will burn with enthusiasm where Werbel continues to fan its fires. A less, less division organization. More division recovery rate, more attack, which is awesome, less training level. Soldati, soldati bez granites. Granites. Soldiers without, I'm going to assume without borders, so. The enemy's defeated? Great. We kind of saw that one coming too. And there goes the manpower. Whoopsie. Agriculture is super important. And political campaigns. Da, 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 nope, nothing there. Wow, we actually fought. Who, who is that now? Who are you? Gary Patrick Hemming. Okay, cool. Very nice, very nice. Oh, we have 13 guys. Never mind. One, two, three. Well, one, two, three, four. There you go. There you go. That's better. <clears throat> Six days left. 
The best guns money can buy. Me new members of the Mikoski's army are here, heating her wearables called to arms on far eastern reaches of Russia. An unprecedented number of mercenaries have arrived on our shores, ready to build a new army. The issue is now not of one of numbers, but how to equip these professional soldiers. Though the Siberian factions are doing all they can, a deficit of weapons and supplies remains. Luckily, Werble has a plan, and Madagascar has fallen apart. Mitchell Werble is a man who knows the underworld and recognizes it. By pulling a few favors and greasing a few palms, a legendary mercenary can rectify the weapons shortage within with easy claims. If Minkowski agrees to it, he promises to fill the armories of Magadan with not only an astounding quantity of weapons, but also with the state-of-the-art ones, not the cheap local productions. Moreover, he vows to Minkowski that he will lead his army to unite Russia come hell or high water. A uh, vow that we must be careful to hold him to. Get 2,500 more guns? Cost of driven Madagascar? I thought we were supposed to get an event for the last one as well. Like, this one's... Oh, no. We didn't. Oh, that's fine. It's fine. I always assume that there's only an event after every single one of them are read, but the back of the truck, Warble's promises have been born fruit. Seemingly out of nowhere, the weapons have materialized to support Mikoski's cause at a rate so low that it was almost not profitable. Though his motives are still a mystery, he doesn't appear to be a threat yet. However, the shortage remains, and though it isn't severe as before, it might be wise to keep a cache of arms for a rainy day, and it rains in Siberia most of the time if, not, if it's not snowing. You see the crisis, huh? Like a magician pulling one trick after another out of his hat, Warball has another solution to offer to Mikotsky regarding the shortage. He knows that the smuggling routes in the Bering Strait safe from the wash of the Soviet remnant navy currently stationed in Kamchatka. From the south, he also knows the ways of Japanese Manchuria hidden from the sides of the Imperial Japanese Army. These routes, he reckons, will be sufficient to end the arm shortages currently plaguing us. We have a little choice then to listen to him. Nice. Cool. How's this coming along? November 3rd, it looks like. Not very good for us, but whatever. Ooh, what can we do here? Do we raid? Very good. Coffee's pretty good, too. Still somewhat warm. And these cold Siberian knots. Followed up with, ready at last. Ooh. We should be able to do this one. So, the reformation of the Siberian army is complete. We're now ready to confront confront our old adversaries. Rodzevsky is currently residing in Amur. Our army is ready to mend the old split of the RFP at long last. Some of our most seasoned veterans have been dreaming of this day ever since Mikovsky's capture of Magadan. The party shall be won again after all these years. Mikovsky and his officers will order all personnel to stand by and prepare for the operation against Amur, effective immediately. Our victory is assured so long as everything that we've planned goes our way. The only wild card on the table is Werbel, the mercenary that Von Siatsky brought with him. Hopefully, we will have kept him on a tight enough leash that he does not do anything that would interfere with our plans, but... Some among our ranks know his rising power and doubt that our current measures are enough. Nonetheless, the operation must go forward. There goes part of Madagascar. No one cares. Industrial development. Don't mind if we do. Industrial aid. Magana Free Radio broadcast 60. So, Vasily, tonight we have something new to showcase to the audience. Of course, folks, it. Our poor listeners cannot see into this office, but let me describe it to you, my loyal followers of the Vaz who just turned in, who tuned in tonight. A pause into the. Whoops, sorry. Dropped it. Another pause before the same boys beaming with excitement. This is an American-made M1911, courtesy of our friends in the CIA. Please don't wave that thing around, Sergei, a smooth baritone said. Evidently, silly. That gun is loaded. A sigh. Apologies, dear audience. It appears that my friend Sergei is a bit of an idiot. A chuckle. Don't be so negative, Vasily, Sergei said, getting more and more excited by the minute. This weapon has a safety. Hear that? The pull of a trigger. Click, click. Click, nothing happened. That's because the safety is preventing the firing mechanism from engaging fancy thing. Fancy and clever people, these Americans. And what does this weapon have that Russian ones don't? Well, you see, Vasily, a clatter as Sergei set the pistols down on a surface somewhere. This gun has a power of a rifle, condensed into a compact and easily carried package, making even the least armed of our soldiers dangerous. A pause. Let me pick that up. Let me pick up that thing again and show you how it's done. Please don't wave that thing around. Tinnitus rang, a discordant sound that seemed to shatter any resemblance of coherence. What did you just do? Just another day in the office of the MFR. Oh, I love 1911s. I wonder what caliber it is. Probably 45. Should be paid. As we should be paid. <clears throat> American relations, absolutely. Now, a report for Langley. Transmission 01, Agent Mason, currently stationed in Magadan. Subject, on the, the training equipment, uh, training and equipment of Mikovsky's forces. A review. Content. 
Before we came to the town of Magadan, acting at the behest of the Congress as well as the Department of Defense in good favor to the leader of the RFP, Magotsky most of the armed forces consisted of fascist militias with little to no experience in actual warfare. The equipment was in a similarly poor state with almost with most soldiers equipped with creaking almost non-functional rifles like old Arasaka models and mostly Nagants, dating back to the days of the Great War, a good fit for an army of wax models in a museum perhaps, but not enough for a host with a intent to fight as a Vaz Russian leader. Humbly put it, a total crusade to save Russia. <clears throat> We, need com we commenced training as soon as we pinned down the RFP situation. That is where we encountered another problem. The nepotism ingrained within the officer corps of the RFP was so prevalent that the men who could barely hold the weight of a rifle bore such high ranks as lieutenant, captain, or even major. Pressed on the issue, the Vaz agreed to fire these people immediately, much to his credit. It also approved the building of several officer schools to build up the high ranks of his army into shape. The birth that we received from the front line indicates good results. The border clash against their neighbors indicated a good increase in performance. Regardless of victory and defeat, we will continue to monitor these situation and issue reports whenever possible. Mason out. A spectacular growth. It's absolutely spectacular. So they bets granite. From the outset, the Webo's goons were different from the regulars of the RFP militias. And Magadan, they walked down around the town, their expensive gear strapped to the boots, flirting with the girls and ladies they saw along the way. They seemed not to have a care for Russia. It was just another playground for them, a vacation, a holiday, and a desolate land where they can go shoot the natives. Smith, no given last name, in particular, came from South Africa. His hands itching for the trigger of the gun, his ears for the throw of the gun fired, his head and brain for the conduct, and saw barbarity, raw barbarity, of combat. Werbel wasn't lying when he said that his gear was going to be good. His M16 strapped to his back was the meanest piece of lead spitter this side of Russia. The RFP militias did not have, have them, only given old US M1 Garands instead, for they were not Smith. The fields, savannas, plains, and jungles of Africa made themselves known throughout this copper burnt sunburnt skin. They had all the reason in the world to be cocky. When his folks back home asked him why he had gone into the business, he, to find a lady came the answer. All who truly understood Smith knew that he wasn't in it for love but the thrill of war and money. He could see the Russians eyeing his gear with envy in their eyes. He smirked at them and winked. Every time he smoked, they would marvel at his tidy, clean, and well rolled cigarettes. Once in a while, he even offered one of them. Warfare was a trade and business was good. Leaning back against a wall in a random part of the Podunk town, he looked or took one of his fabulous cigarettes out and lit one. For a backwater and deserted place, Magadan was pretty good. Not on the level of Bonfontein, but pleasant enough. However, his heart was never there. Out west, closer to the lines of the Tsars and Rodzeski's loyalists, beneath the blazing gunfire and artillery bombardments, that where was where he belonged. With a puff of smoke, he threw the cigarette down and stepped on it. It was time for action. Smith, reporting in. Seems like we're ready at last. Death of Von Siatsky. Mr. Von Siatsky, are you there? Dmitri erupted in the door. Mr. Von Siatsky, the boss is waiting for you. It's no use, Dmitri, Ivan said, sighing and catching his breath. I've been at this door for hours and I haven't gotten any answers yet. Trying to try something else, Dmitri thought. Kneeling, he stared back at the keyhole of the doorknob. He could do this. Taking out a lockpick from his locks, Dmitri gingerly inserted it, working as if as to leave the machinations inside undisturbed and unharmed. The door had to open somehow and jam in the keyhole would only make it harder for everyone. Might even require an axe, he chuckled. Ivan was about to protest several times, in fact. They could have just asked for a spare key, but Dmitri wouldn't hear of it. The door clicked. Dmitri stood, containing his jump at the very last moment. See, he said to Ivan, who gave a dry smile in response. Dmitri turned the knob, but the door wouldn't budge. Bolted from the inside, gosh darn it. He kicked the door in a fit of rage. Ivan topped his shoulder, gesturing for him to move. Brandishing an axe, he swung it several times against the door as bits and pieces of wood fly in every direction. At the very last moment, when Ivan was about to give up, the door gave way. Mr. Von Siatsky, are you not... Ivan stops mid-sentence, laying on the ground floor. Clutching his chest was Von, S Von Siatsky, his eyes glassy, his face pale. He was dead. Sometime in the evening, the phone rang in Matkovsky's office. We defer our payment to you, friend Matkovsky. Oh boy. Oh boy, what's going on? Oh no! The mercenary coup. Ivan and Boris did not like their new assignment. Transferred from the political wing of the RFP to the army right before the eve of the operation, they were, as their instructors put it, dead weight. An officer handed them their bold action rifles and told them to stick with the rear guard where the, no, where the chance of survival was the highest. There's no danger here, and the Siberian woods are quiet, the whistle, wind whistling behind the trees, between the trees and the air, cold as ever. You think the boss will let us back? Uh, Boris asked Ivan, who was squatting beside him, watching his surroundings while smoking a flimsy cigarette. The only reply he got was a listless shake of the head and a hush. Ivan knew his stuff, at least to show he wasn't in oh, over his head. The hand that gripped the cig shook. It gave me the air, it could be a genuine anxiety or terror in the face of war. A figure passed ahead in the dirt trails they were watching. A mercenary. It was apparent from the gear they carried. Proper camouflage, an assault rifle, a belt chock full of grenades, as well as other miscellaneous tools of warfare, and most importantly, the attitude. The man walked forward without any concern or worry, his footsteps lighter than the bravest man in the RFP. However, he had not he had no reason to be here. The front lines were as where he belonged, not here. Halt, Boris said, unslinging his rifle and pointing it in the mercenary who did likewise. Ivan saw Paul's suit. Turn back, the front lines are over there. The mercenary said nothing and shot at Boris. It hit, and Boris was thrown off his feet. Ivan fired back, kneeling the mercenary in the shoulder. 
all over the lines. Incidents like these flared up, and the operation was called off in a panic. Werewolves could begin. Hindsight is 2020. No longer required. More fascism support. Werewolf retires, or the Mercenary Gambit succeeds. And. Now that's a nice flag. The Republic of West Alaska. Oh, we're a nice, lovely blue. Oh, this makes me happy. This makes me so happy. Look at this. The Vaz who sold the, the man who sold the Vaz. The death of Vonsiaski was in some respects inevitable. With his departure, the RFP lost his monetary support from overseas, strandling or stranding the mercenaries as strangers in a strange land. Left with little choice, Mitchell Werbel had launched his coup in the middle of the preparations of war against another Russian fascist base in Amur. Konstantin Rozevsky, scattering at Metkovsky's army, Verbal has now come into possession of the port town of Magadan. Fortunately, Metkovsky has escaped. It might not be much, but Magadan is a harbor large enough to accommodate any soldiers of fortune that he did Werbel's call. Though small Small number, the mercenaries were roaming patrol the borders of Magadan, hunting down soldiers who swore their loyalty to Metkovsky. We present to our so to our prisoners two choices: fight for Werbel or die. Heck, even in the long and deep searching of the country, we might find even Metkovsky himself. After he's dead, we will consider that debt settled. Time to call in the cavalry, my friends. Oh, this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be a fun campaign. Soldati best granted. The enforcer. Even by the standards of the Far East, this was a crappy bar. The floor was creaked to the slightest movement, and the beer tasted like beer, bear piss. There wasn't even plumbing, and yet this was Werbel's choice for a meeting place. Alexander Pavlov was decidedly unimpressed. Mikowski, his old boss, had taken great care to manage his image, all for the benefit of the Americans. Now the Americans were here, and they behaved like pigs. Even the mercenaries were busy stinking up the bar with their ugly accents and drunken hooliganism. The only thing keeping him here was the fact that Pavlov's transition from the orderly world of fascism to the chaotic pecuniary land of the new Far East had not been exactly smooth. He needed word and badly. He resolved, perhaps unwisely, to hear Werbel out. When the mercenary captain sat down at the table at last, 30 minutes before behind schedule, Pavlov straightened his posture self-consciously and gave his greetings. Mr. Werbel, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, and he's... As you're no doubt aware, I've served under the previous administration as a Vaz top man in matters of internal security, and to find a short order that I'm quite professional, should you cho choose to entrust me with such matters. <clears throat> Werbel met his offers with complete silence. Pavlov first thought at first that this was contemplation, before realizing that mercenaries' eyes were completely uncomprehending. Oh, dear lord, the man barely understood Russian. Werbel pushed one of the other mercenaries over the t to the table and beckoned Pavlov to, to continue. <clears throat> The rest of the negotiations progressed with the other man clumsily interpreting in a slightly le less bad Russian. And that proved surprisingly fruitful. Clearly, the Americans had a deficit of loyal locals, and Pavlov was more than happy to fill it. Once a collaborator, always a collaborator. <clears throat> a republic. Oh, just so good. Actually, mm, we're going to keep Werbel here, but once we get special forces, I'm going to move things around a little bit more. So. And as always, out of manpower. Actually, we got 13 guys still, but. Next up, taking back what's ours. Oh, we go straight to war with the Moor. Wow. Mikowski, our original employer, thought to pursue a war with the other wing of the Russian fascist party led by Konstantin Rodzewski. We have no business in this line to get than to get paid for a job well done in the field otherwise. Their ideological concerns, splits, differences, splinters don't mean anything to us. However, with thousands of men begging for transport to other parts of the world, we can cut them a deal of a lifetime. We'll go to war against Amur. This Constantine might be have been parting in his offices, rejoicing in the fact that Matkoski is seemingly gone forever, and the mercenaries will ship out an order. Well, he's in, he's in for a surprise. We'll cross our informal border and destroy them. There's nothing personal, Mr. Rozevsky. In our defense, we're not after you, but the stuff that you keep in your vault. After we drag him and his followers out of Siberia, perhaps it would be a good time to start looking forward to something else, something different. Five divisions are going to be more than enough for us to destroy these guys. We have one, two, three. Oh, okay. Is it my mouse? It might be my mouse. I can't. Get a one, two, three, four. We'll only do four. Uh, actually, we have Rifle Unit Alpha. Oh, that's kind of cool. The man who sold the vase. Dimitri's mind wandered as he dipped below and soared above death. In his mind, there were no distinctions to be made. He was dead. An alien object nestled itself in the, his left shoulder, refusing all attempts to move it. The pain kept on giving a radiant sound that bled an unfading, persistent, coppery smell. He had the faintest idea of what had happened to him, and his images surfing, surfacing along... With the shocks of pain that sent him receding towards the depths of unconsciousness, he was expected for expecting for Ivan to leave him for dead and to make for the lines in all haste. Their assignment was a fault of his pride after all, but he felt himself tumble and shake, but never failing or falling. <clears throat> say what you say, say what you would about Ivan, quiet, brutish, stupid. 
but he was a good friend. Dimitri's blood-stained and pain-wracked mind squeezed skepticism of Ivan's efforts, but his heart begged him to hope. Implored with every beat, refusing to let itself die, it grew fainter and fainter as the hours passed by, but it dragged its death out, instinct, not intellect, it became the lifeline upon which Dimitri hung himself. His grasp was tenuous, and at every turn of the forest trail through every bush that Ivan's feet trudged on, he would not let go. At long last, Ivan's feet gave. He collapsed, sending Dimitri tumbling through the ground with dirt and rocks striking his face and body. He felt his wound open as the bandages that held him together tore itself apart. Sound, noise, noises, voices, footsteps through the ground, noises of guns, voices of gruff men in foreign languages cloud his inferior mind. As he passed out from the world to the next, he heard gunfire and saw muzzle flashes out of the corner of his eye. In his final moments, he smiled. Ivan was not going quietly. He faded away, his consciousness crumbling like dust in the winter kiss forest of Siberia. Such is the cost of defeat. Very, very good. So how are we supposed to go to war with no manpower? Easy, just fight harder. All right, let's see. Infrastructure research. Oh, it looks like we maybe lost some more stability. Maybe. We medium taxation, huh? Actually, oh, we lost the thing with the Americans, too, so. I love this flag. That's an awesome, awesome flag. The broken skull with the green beret and a smoking cigar. Thinking back what's ours. Followed up with nothing else, because we got to win against them. we got to own Amur, which is fine. So, you guys come on in, and we're going to circle these divisions and say bye-bye to them. You guys, hopefully move your little butts fast enough to get down there. Come to Zaya, and go right there. And let these guys come on in if they actually want to. I don't really care, to be honest with you. Don't really care. They're not moving, which is good. Because we'll attack Chumacan if we can't quickly. There you go. Central Siberian Republic declare one of the Siberian Black Army. So we need to play as that group. We'll see what happens eventually. Good, good, good. Um, I don't really care about this province. It, is, it really doesn't matter to me. Oh, they actually have someone here, huh? Well, again, hold, hold the line, then. That's fine. No worries. These guys aren't moving. That's my biggest concern, is those guys moving. Build new schools, new workers. Schools are probably better. Let's do that one. There we go. They got two divisions right there. Zaya will be ours, hopefully, very soon. Man, these guys take a while to move. Take quite a while. Like, all I want you to do is just hold. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Ooh, another division. Don't mind. It. Seven divisions. Not bad. All right. Immediately kill them off. Zay is ours. Cut these guys off. All right. So two of you guys are moving this way. You. You. You're almost there. So you kind of hold. Come on this way to help them out. As we'll come all the way down there and we'll take them out. Not too bad. Pretty easy. Uh, dare for the sake of love. Cool. There goes Oro. See how? Very nice, very nice. Cut these guys off. They'll start starving for supplies. Which is the plan here. And once they start moving here, we're going to attack. Yep. We not, might not be able to win, but as long as we can get down here fast enough, we should do okay. Oh, we won there. You guys head here immediately. You guys moving around. Keep them in place. Keep them in place. We can't lose Zaya. We got that top. And... Oh, did we get it? Yeah, there we go. Easy, right? And we shall end our episode very soon by doing another focus. Oopsie. Come on. Consolidate control. The time has come for a final war against Rodzewski. His resume is quite long. A banned king reigning from Amur, founder of the RFP, an anti Semite extraordinaire. Well, Werbel, however, does not care at all for him at all, <clears throat> nor are they partisan in fighting the RFP. All that matters at this point is survival. Rodzewski stands in a way to accomplish that. Without Amur's mineral deposits, paying for the mercenaries is on an unappealing export of fish and bread is impossible. We need to find some way out, and Rodzewski has something that we all want. A time to turn grip on the Far East. Rodzewski cannot be allowed to stand at all. His army bandits and fascist amateurs stand, shall stand no chance against a modern economy or modern experienced army, armed with the best gear in the whole known earth. As soon as we deal with them, we shall start planning for our future. God knows we have so many choices to choose from. Cool, but that's going to end today's episode. If you liked it, consider living a uh, you know, life. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will continue to expand across Siberia and have a good time with the Republic of West Alaska. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.